Welcome to my channel. It's committed to empowering you to break into technology sales and use the career path to create more freedom in your life. We've got an amazing guest today, Brandon Fluharty. You've probably heard of him before, but he was grinding as an account executive and followed the classic track to making a little over 200K in that range. Uh, but he was burning out. He was really grinding. And then he unlocked the secret to break into the next level. And he started making seven figures and he did so three or more, I forget, Brandon, years in a row, at least three, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was three years in a row. Pretty incredible, right? And so today we're going to dig into his mindset and his approach to becoming a seven-figure earner. And I've got a specific set of questions to pull out some of the best nuggets for you to model after his success and have a clear North Star of what you can really achieve in tech sales. So guys, make sure to like this video so more people could benefit from the message because the algorithm loves that and will actually show the uh, video to more people and subscribe to the channel for weekly videos committed to your success in tech sales. Brandon, thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? How's everything been during the holidays? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's ironically been hectic, but looking forward to some you know, more quiet time over the next couple of weeks. So yeah, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Really good to have you. And I think we're all looking forward to more downtime and quiet time. So <laughs> let's just dig right into it. What yeah. did it feel like when you made a million dollars in a single year for the first time? Yeah. yeah, you'd kind of think it's like hitting the lottery, uh, but really nothing felt all that different uh, for, for me. And I think a little bit of that was deliberate uh, by design. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't inflating my lifestyle too quickly. So, you know, going from 200K to a million and a half um, in the course of 12 months, you know, there were moments, right, where I was getting, you know, some extremely big commission checks and payouts. Um, and so I wanted to sort of do very, yeah, I think sustainable, you know, long term thinking type of decisions. And one of them was to pay off my house in full instead of upgrading to a luxury home, uh, which was tempting. It was very easy to do. Instead of opting for the flashy Porsche, um, you know, kept driving a Subaru. Um, so I, I tried to be really deliberate. And I think a lot of that stems from I had to go through a bankruptcy when I was a young adult. And that was a very painful experience. It was very painful to have to rebuild my credit uh, from the ground up, but it was probably the best financial education I could have received. And luckily, before coming into that level of income, I was able to be smart enough to to make those long term type of decisions. It sounds like a painful experience actually prepared you to have the discipline and be responsible when you did get these crazy commission checks. I can't. Yeah. yeah, it's unfortunate that it had to to be something like that to to do that, at least for, for me personally. Not everybody obviously has to go through a bankruptcy to learn fiscal responsibility, but uh, it was a hard lesson I had to learn. And luckily, I had it early enough in my, in my life that um, when I did come into some massive income, uh, you know, I, I, I could make the right decisions that didn't keep me tied. Those, those golden handcuffs that we hear about. Uh, whether that's through big commission checks or big stock options, yeah. uh, RSUs, um, you know, or a combination of both, you know, people can get stuck on that corporate hamster wheel. And luckily I had the foresight to, to think a little bit beyond that. What was going to be my next step? What are the decisions I can make today that put me in a better position tomorrow to make the decisions I want for myself? Mm, already a really great lesson to be mindful with your money. Cause just if, if you yeah. make more money, a lot of people, and I've done this in years where I got like a base raise or change companies and got a higher base. I actually spent more, like I moved into a luxury condo yeah. downtown and yeah. I didn't actually save anything or yeah. generate anything extra to invest. So great lesson. Now, how do you leverage your financial freedom and your excess capital to create a fulfilling and rich life? What do you actually put it towards? Yeah. I mean, it's not to say I didn't treat myself like, uh, you know, my wife and I, we treated ourselves to some experiences. Um, and there are smart ways that you can do that as well instead of, you know, but again, I was traveling a lot for work. So the classic leisure trip was worked well in our favor. So when we took trips, we tacked on and my wife was in a position to be able to do this with me. 
um, we would track on tack on a few days to each of our business trips. And again, I had a bit of the freedom and flexibility to do that um, with my work. So there were small things. Um, I'm really into cycling. So that I didn't skimp on, but instead of, you know, uh, uh, leveling up to a multi-million dollar luxury home, you know, I could justify a, you know, $12,000 bike or a $9,000 bike. Um, that was really expensive for a bike, but at least not in comparison to, um, a Porsche or a luxury home. So those little things, um, I would treat myself to, um, after usually paying my future self first. Um, and so there are small little things that you can do to sort of gamify this experience. It shouldn't just be constantly saving. Um, everybody's different and, uh, you know, there's, there's an appetite for certain things. Um, but I did want to treat myself and, and, you know, reward that hard work when it, when these transformational deals closed, I wanted to be sure that there was an experience at the end of that, that, uh, I could look forward to, but I kind of look at it that what I'm, what I did eventually, uh, I, I wanted to use this life changing income. Um, you know, it was more around the year two or year three that I started to become more deliberate about using the investment to be able to slow down and become more intentional in my life. Mm. And I look at it across really three phases that if you're a SaaS seller, uh, or more broadly, a performance based knowledge worker, um, you're sort of the, the hierarchy. You have the ability from a, a corporate worker standpoint, you have the ability to be a bit more in control based on your performance to drive up phase one, which is trade time for more dollars, right? We're all given the same amount of 1,440 minutes, 24 hours in a day. That doesn't change for any of us, but the impact that you make in that same amount of time by harnessing your knowledge, your specialized knowledge and protecting your energy, protecting your attention and driving that towards ways that you can up the, uh, your earnings per hour, that uh, are some of the strategic initiatives. And that's what that phase was for me. It was the tail end of that phase. Most of us enter the sales corporate worlds um, after maybe having a, a non-knowledge work-based role, you know, growing up. Uh, in high school, um, or we get into things like retail or whatever it is, where it's, yes. it's just learning uh, in, in that role to eventually then getting into more of an apprenticeship of, of learning how to harness our knowledge and, and acquire specific skills. And then we can apply those skills. Um, but that's really sort of phase one to more freedom and autonomy if you prize those things. So the next level was once I started earning more um, in that time, I wanted to diversify those gro growing dollars. So I wanted to start putting that income to use when I wasn't actively working. Mm -hmm. And some things I, I invested in a property in Chicago as COVID hit, everybody was leaving urban cities and it was a good time to invest. Fell in love with Chicago. Chicago is a lot less expensive than the likes of New York or San Francisco. Don't tell me you're a Bears fan. I'm a Packers. Uh, no, okay. Uh, no, <laughs> not. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, more of the other football. Uh, I consider myself more of a Chicago, Chicago Fire fan. Uh, oh, interesting. So, um, but anyways, I I wanted to diversify that a bit. Those diversify those income streams, and I I really got into just personally more of productizing myself, getting into digital income. Um, how can I take my specialized knowledge, put that, package that up in something like an ebook and let that start earning income for myself uh, while I'm sleeping? You know, the classic earn while you sleep. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's still a level three beyond that. And that's when you can start to break beyond the corporate world, get off one hamster wheel and make sure that you don't instantly get on another hamster wheel, which is continue to trade time for dollars, um, whether that be through coaching, whether that be through consulting, yes. um, that's usually the classic approach and it's an honorable approach. But again, if you're more deliberate about freeing up your time, uh, and slowing down, I wanted to get multiple incomes 
income streams running so that I wasn't in that, that vicious cycle. Uh, cause again, we have the same amount of limited time. How do I make the biggest impact in that time? And so for me, I just got really interested in creating content, digital products, and, um, and starting to use the power of AI and, and use the power of content creation, the power of this new economic world, the creator economy to share that knowledge and productize uh, my, my knowledge so that other people could take advantage and my impact could actually scale without having to trade time for dollars. So those are sort of the three levels and progressions that I went through. That was so thorough. And personally, I'm going to rewatch those th uh, three phases. It's super helpful to see how you can maximize your income within a company, but then start to move yeah. toward becoming more free through real estate, productizing yourself, creating content. And speaking of content, I love your content. And I put out content, but you're the one I learned from, and it actually spills over into my content. And so I noticed there was um, a post you did on LinkedIn that I even incorporated in a YouTube video. I hope you're okay with that, at least the visual. Oh, cool. And I yeah. reference you of how now is actually still a great time to get into tech sales. There yeah. are people that have been sprinting towards the tech sales opportunity. They realize it's great, but now they're slowing to a jog yeah. as they hear about an economic slowdown. Yeah. And so why is now still you know, a good time to get into technology sales? Yeah. Uh, you know, SaaS business, software as a service is still a high margin business. And, you know, especially if you're at the upper end of that scale, focusing on enterprise or strategic accounts, chat GPT is not coming after your job. Um, in fact, I don't think really chat GPT is coming after anyone's job. Uh, it's more of an augment of human intelligence working with artificial intelligence. That's a whole side topic that we could have a whole episode on. Yeah. But um, of course, right, there is economic pain. Um, unfortunately, we see it in layoffs um, with a lot of, of folks being laid off. We see a lot of, you know, these large companies needing to scale back, cut back, rethink, right? There is a return to rigor. And I th personally think a return to rigor is great because if you think about it, there is less competition out there. Um, yeah. So if you go from being a seller who focuses on a sales process, which is all oriented on you, the seller, and move more towards designing a better buying experience, which is all about them, the buyer or the executive, that is a great opportunity to uh, capitalize on uh, this low competition field and separate yourself even further, right? Because there is even less noise. And so if you can figure out a way to talk more transformatively to that executive and help them leave a legacy, that is, is where you can not ask for budget, but you uncover and unlock budget Ooh. because you're inviting them to design their legacy together. So it's a fundamentally different experience than most sellers are taught today. So we're going to get to selling transformationally versus transactionally, which is yeah. from my understanding, one of your seven steps to yeah. seven figures. Yeah. But um, before we get into that, I was curious, what are the prerequisites to join the seven figure earner club? Because you can't get there overnight. There's a path, isn't there? There is. Yeah. I, I think there are simple things that we can look at um, that if you truly want to make over a million dollars a year in SaaS sales, um, you need to be selling into the enterprise, true enterprise. You know, I'm talking more of like the Fortune 500. Um, so strategic accounts, enterprise accounts. Um, nothing against SMB sellers. I've seen SMB sellers become millionaires. Uh, I have yet to see as an individual contributor without a workforce under you uh, where you can make seven figures individually. Um, the transaction value, the, the, the contract value just aren't high enough. There aren't <laughs> enough hours in the day to get those deals done as an individual. Again, maybe different if you have a workforce under you selling into SMBs, but 
as an individual contributor, you need to be selling into the enterprise. Um, and then having the experience um, to, again, sell into those enterprises. Again, we're talking with high-level executives where you want to help them leave a legacy. Tapping into that legacy you know, requires experience. So I think a good default is at minimum three years experience talking um, and communicating at the executive level is, is necessary. And then the third criteria is you need to have patience. Um, this is not an activity driven approach. This is an impact driven approach. So sales cycles are going to be long. They're going to be even longer when there is a return to rigor like we're experiencing today. And there is more scrutiny on every deal. There are more stakeholders involved to, to approve even the, the smallest deal. So that takes patience. So having that the patience, the long stretches of not yes. closing a deal and maintaining your level of confidence and high mm. self-esteem, that's really critical. So those would, I would identify as the three key things that you need to embody if you want to enter the seven figure earners territory. It sounds like delayed gratification is so yeah. important and patience and just yeah. be playing chess instead of checkers. And do you know that marshmallow study where they put marshmallows in front of children yeah. and they told the children if they don't eat the marshmallow a certain time, they get two. And they right. followed those kids in a late age and the ones that actually held off were better off in every aspect of their life, career, family, et cetera. So you reminded me of that. Clearly, yeah. you would have been the kid who didn't eat the market. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe this was developed later in life. but It'd be interesting. Yeah. So before moving on to digging a little more into the seven steps, I've got yeah. questions around those things. Can yeah. you paint a, a little more of a vivid picture of the company you were at? I know it was a yeah. late stage startup. Weren't you selling like conversational AI and what your deal size look like and the types yeah. of enterprise companies I think you said JetBlue that you were selling to. I'm kind of stealing your thunder, but can you paint yeah, a vivid yeah. picture for the audience? Yeah, um, actually. So the, b before I was with a late stage startup before joining uh, the, this company. Oh, uh, actually, it's you know Live Person. It's a public company. It's not the most well known company out there, but um, they have tremendous awards when it comes to artificial intelligence. Oh. And so I was with a late stage startup selling enterprise software. Um, late stage startup out of San Francisco, cool company. I wasn't experiencing a whole lot of pain. I was enjoying myself as an enterprise seller. Um, but I kept two lists. I kept two lists of you know, a handful of, you know, really marquee companies that I'd be willing to talk with and industries that I, that piqued my curiosity and live person sat on the industry list, uh, having, been in conversational AI. Uh, I was really interested in, in exploring that, knowing AI was going to fundamentally change our lives personally for decades to come. So uh, that's what uh, fueled my curiosity to pursue even an opportunity, even when I wasn't experiencing a lot of pain and was enjoying myself as an enterprise seller. Um, and then live person, about 1,300 employees. So again, not the largest. It's certainly not a Salesforce, not an Oracle, SAP, uh, where you hear a lot of you know other mega deal uh, closers out there, other seven-figure earners. Um, so not commonplace, although I think there is massive opportunities for smaller companies um, that sort of fit this unique criteria. So the cool thing is about Live Person, it felt like a late stage startup, but it had the resources of a public company. Um, and it had the resources of being an enterprise first company versus where I was before, a company that aspired to go upstream to the enterprise starting in, in the SMB level. That's where I see a lot of product led growth companies start to really struggle when they try to go upstream and don't have true enterprise first capabilities in place, much harder to sell those transformative deals. Um, and so that was, again, part of the criteria of, of really attracting me to that organization. I wasn't deliberately thinking, oh, I have to make a million dollars in sales and live person is going to be the way to do that. It was more once I became got into that environment um, I knew always throughout my career, it was a possibility. 
it started to become more solidified once I was in that environment. So what I realized is we did dig into the first point, which is environment matters. Yeah. yeah. So is there any color you would add yeah. to advise people on how to navigate finding the right environment? Yeah, the way I did it was I tried to become as objective as possible in usually a very emotional decision. So I created a simple spreadsheet of kind of where I was and what I was evaluating where to go. And I created some criteria that had a little extra special weight versus other criteria that I also wanted to evaluate. So things like people um, was a top criteria for me. So who you work for also matters, right? And I wanted to really dig into, you know, if, if these are going to be the leaders that I'm entrusting my future with, and another core principle of mine is I always looked at any new role, especially in the enterprise or strategic selling space, I wanted to have long-term thinking, but not too, too long-term. Um, so I had always look at three-year benchmarks of, okay, if I'm going to commit somewhere, I'm mentally committing to that place for a minimum of three years. Then I'll lift my head back up and evaluate, is this still serving me? Of course, I would check in with myself, say on an annual basis, but three years is about how much time you need to give some place to really truly benefit from it. Um, and so, yeah. I just got to say, that's so funny. I was at Oracle for three years. I was at yeah. Google for three years. Yeah. And then I ran into some pains, you know, yeah. in both instances. And Google's incredible, but nothing's perfect. Right. Now I'm in my current role and it's extremely exciting. We're trying to go public and I believe we're going to do it pretty yeah. soon. But you, you can never predict. But that's so funny. The three-year yeah. metric has been exactly my career. Back to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not perfect, but again, it at least puts you in a place where you can remove the distractions, right? No more accepting of... of uh, messages from recruiters on LinkedIn, right? Turn that, that recruiter status off, or I'm, I'm actively searching, you know, you can, so you can make, start making deliberate decisions on, okay, I'm going to put my head down here and really focus on getting maximum value and leverage gaining new skills and applying my skills here. So with that, I, I wanted to stack rank some criteria that's really important. And honestly, comp of the, the, the big criteria that was last on my list. Usually for a lot of folks, it's first. So people who you work for, the leader that you're going to be working under, you want to understand how they think. You want to understand what kind of autonomy and flexibility you're going to have. What's their vision? What makes them tick? Those things are really important to ask. Because let's face it, when you are, whether you've been laid off and you're actively looking or you're a top producer uh, and you're maybe perhaps getting a little bored or you're at that three-year mark and you're kind of questioning, should I stay, should I go? Um, it's important to do your proper due diligence and who you work for really matters. And then things like culture are, are really important as well. So again, I found a great sweet spot in live person that it felt like a late stage startup, only 1300 employees, uh, it certainly operated, you know, very lean um, as a, I think, two and a half billion dollar uh, valuation wow. company. Um, you know, it was, it was important that I, I kept that culture intact. But again, I, I could rely on the resources of a 25 year old company, a public company that had real life enterprise customers that they could showcase to the world. So those things were, you know, that was a happy harmony for me that, that I, I wanted to tap into. Um, and, and so, you know, then I had, you know, other criteria, but ultimately um, COP was not first. It was, it was last. And then I had smaller criteria. So I had this spreadsheet. I weighted those big criteria a little bit more and then other more personalized criteria more specifically uh, a smaller weight. And then I just try to evaluate at the start of the engagement with the, the company. And then at the end of the engagement, when it was time to make a decision, 
the, that scoring allowed me to take the emotion out of it and allow me to, again, more objectively look at this big decision and sit with it, uh, uh, you know, objectively and, you know, make a decision based off of that. So ultimately it, it worked in live person's favor. I made the leap and obviously haven't looked back. Guys, quick little plug, by the way, if you're getting value out of this, make sure to hit that like button and also check out Brandon's website. It's linked in the description and his seven steps to seven figures. We're digging in here, but if you really want to go in depth and get the most juice out of it, um, check it out yourself. I actually checked it out myself as well. Anyways, we're back. So I uh, had to do that little plug. But could you talk a little bit about how um, you apply math and numbers to projecting how much money you can make in a given role and ultimately how you use that to protect your time? Yeah, I think, you know, again, when you're in sort of this phase one um, area where you're trying to figure out, okay, I'm in a W-2 role. I am in a corporate environment. There's a baseline metric I can use, which is, you know, your effective hourly selling rate. And it's very easy to calculate this. You can just you know, go into your HR system and look at the past 12 months and it'll give you clear guidance of how many hours you worked. And if you just take here in the US, say a three week PTO is commonplace, 10 holidays and a uh, what 40 hour week, um, roughly it's it equates to about 18 Hundred in uh, eight hundred, eight hundred. Excuse me, eighteen hundred and eighty hours in a year um, is is effectively used for uh, potentially selling. Right, eight hour day and an eight hour day is a good benchmark. Right, we don't want to kill ourselves and be working 12, 13, 14 hours. Right, that's just inefficient. Are there times when you need to do that? Certainly, um, but that shouldn't be the norm. Eight hours of real work a day is a good baseline. So that gives you an effective hourly rate of your time. And then you can start to pull certain levers. Okay, well, what if I increased um, my average deal size? What if I increased my effort uh, and added more hours? Don't recommend that again be more effective with those hours um, or close more deals. So you have these levers and then you can work backwards from that. Uh, again, using this hourly rate as a, as a metric to guide yourself. And so I would track that. I would track that. I would track my win rate um, and how long it's taking to close these deals and then figure out, okay, you know, those are important metrics for me to at least map out what I can do. And if you have this data, right, from your existing uh, organization, it's it's easy to, um, you know, plug this into a spreadsheet and, um, you know, just ask yourself, okay, what's my base salary? Um, do I have any additional income coming to me, whether it's RSUs or stock, vested stock options? And that's my locked in earnings. Okay. So that's my starting yeah. point. And if I want to make a million dollars, here's my Delta, here's my gap. Then you take that gap and you then plug in your personal data. Um, how many proposals did you send? What's your closing ratio or your win rate? Again, very important metric that we should be uh, hyper focused on. And then, you know, that gives you your total deals and then your average deal. Um, size. Um, and then again, looking at your hourly rate, then you can layer in, um, uh, you know, improving that hourly rate. So then um, you just add in your quota and your commission plan. So, you know, what's your base and accelerator, typical uh, commission structure for SaaS sellers. And then you can understand, okay, Here's what my locked in earnings are. Um, here's what I need to satisfy to meet quota. Um, and then here's what is left over in accelerator territory to fill the gap 
to become the million dollar earner. And then a good comp plan that I've typically seen is if you can three to four X your quota, your annual quota, that should put you in uh, seven figure territory. Again, I'm talking an enterprise seller, a strategic yeah. seller. Um, usually those uh, sellers are commanding six figure bases between one and 200 K um, and a stock package is usually a part of that. But even still without the stock package, you should be able to um, get into seven figure territory. If you three to four X your um, annual quota. I understand that selling with a transformation mindset is also key to uh, getting into the seven figures club. Can you speak to the difference between a transformation mindset and a transactional selling mindset? Yeah. So I was talking a little bit about this earlier. Um, when you are focused on selling a product or selling your company or positioning yourself against competitors, that's leading with uh, your product or your solution or your company versus leading to it by designing a better buying experience. And, and so that's the mental shift is how do I design a better buying experience that uh, I don't talk about my solutions, I lead to it. And the, the, the thing that I experienced for myself and I, I see really effective with other strategic sellers is putting yourself in the shoes of more of uh, the, a big consulting firm. So the likes of McKinsey, they'll sell a presentation for $400,000, a single presentation. What? Um, they will sell seven, eight, nine figure blueprints that don't include any people, ca human capital or technology, just selling the blueprint for seven, eight, nine figures. And so it's very telling, right? That if you can put yourself in this position, something I call a category of one seller, where you are delivering the insights of a McKenzie, a Deloitte, an Accenture for these large organizations, but have the benefit of being at a direct partner of theirs. That is what executives are craving. Because what that allows you to do is design a better buying experience that helps that executive fulfill their legacy. And so you're not selling technology and services you're selling a different way of operating. Mm. And the only cost that comes along um, for designing that new way of operating and fulfilling that new way of operating is the cost of your product and your services. And you've essentially saved them a seven, eight, not even uh, nine figure bill from Accenture, Deloitte, or the, you know, the big consulting firms that would take 18 months anyways, just to build it out. That's the difference that can use design thinking and systems thinking to create that type of experience versus blindly following an activity driven sales methodology or approach, which measures activity, not impact designing a good buying experience focuses on impact certainly a higher quality going deeper with with your accounts higher win rate those are the outcomes versus i've got to have 5x pipeline going into every quarter stressed out can't get deep enough with with my accounts so i'm forced to only fall back to selling a transaction leading with my product staying low in the organization, participating in RFPs. That's the typical outcome of a sales process driven approach. It's just too funny because my personal experience continues to validate with a data point what you're saying. One of my first mentors at Oracle would flash his W2. He made over a million a year and he would always reference McKinsey. Yeah. It, this is crazy. Exactly what you're saying. And yeah. he would get on calls and he would talk too much but they loved it because he was so brilliant. Like they got a top-notch consultant and the C-level executives were just listening all ears. 
Now here's the key, like why don't people get to that point? I mean, I'm just gonna assume it's a lot of freaking work. You have to really invest yeah. in yourself to get to that level. But like, what's the barrier to, you know, getting there how, and how do people get there? Yeah, a lot of it, uh, one, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work that most people aren't willing to invest. Yeah. Um, two, there's fear, right? There's, you know, we're, we're managed by a fear-based approach that stems from this activity-driven uh, process and, and methodology. Um, and a lot of it too, you know, is, is most sellers aren't in the right environment. Um, so there's this confluence of all these factors where, you know, it's, it's hard for a seller to really operate in, in the way that I think they should, which is it, it's your company. It's, it's, you are the startup and your employer is your VC. They're investing in you. So mm -hmm. what you need to okay. do is develop the right systems and the approach. And that takes time. That takes time to invest with these executives. It takes time to do the proper research or ask for the resources to help do that for you. Develop the, the right tools, the right systems in place that help you have this knowledge so that on every email, every phone call, uh, every meeting, every design session that takes place um, between you and the prospect, it's all about delivering impact. Um, and, and, and a lot of, uh, of environments are driven by this. We just have to drive up activity. Uh, I want to look at how many emails you sent. I want to understand how many proposals have, have been sent out, how many meetings have been sent out. When really the core metric should be, tell me in these one-on-ones, tell me a, a customer story. Not a, oh, I discovered these things. No, tell me a real customer story. Uh, oh, I spoke with Jane uh, at ABC Company, and she was telling me inside their organization, they're having trouble with this, this, and this. And we talked about um, solving that through this, this, and this. That's a customer story, right? That has a better leading indicator into a, a, a real win versus, yeah, I ran five meetings this week. I think that's a good insight too on how people should think about picking the right companies to apply to. It could be a toxic culture when you're just yeah. focused on vanity metrics and number of calls. I think we yeah. want to find a sales culture that is focused on outcomes and that recognize recognizes that being strategic is really important. Yeah. So there's more we could dig into in, the, uh, in terms of this uh, tenant of your seven steps to seven figures, but I really want to encourage folks out there to actually dig in deeper themselves and get the seven yeah. steps to seven figures. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, being super strategic with uh, target accounts and the ones you're actually going after yeah. is critical. So you, can you talk a little bit about how you um, define what you call your diamond accounts? Yeah. And what your criteria is for finding those diamonds in the rough? Yeah, for sure. So uh, this stems from, again, understanding that I was in an environment that dealt with brands that were direct to consumers. So this is, it was awesome for me to be in that environment. And I think this is a great exercise for anybody in the CX or customer experience space, mm. selling into customer experience transformation. Um, because one of the, the easiest things to do in that is be their customer. Um, much easier to do than traditional B2B environments where, you know, it's, it's hard to be uh, a manufacturer, right? If, yeah. Quick question. I yeah. think you revealed a nugget for anyone trying to break in that customer experience is a good segment to start out. And if you can, it's lucrative, uh, customer facing and drives revenue. If you had to throw out a couple options of companies to look at that are really sound companies to begin in the customer experience space, what would they look like? Or what, I mean, what are their names? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would look for um, where you can sell these more transformative experiences. Look for a, a company that has marquee brands um, that are spending over seven figures a year right to solve a challenge um versus just logos right i yeah. want to understand 
what are they spending and why? And, and, and so that would be a key indicator of, okay, you know, they don't just, they haven't just gotten a, a self-service logo that's really big yeah. uh, there and spending $20,000 a year, they're spending $2 million a year and growing. Um, so I'd be looking for that. I'd be looking for something called a maturity model. Um, and here's something I see that's amiss for product led growth, um, companies. Um, they typically use a maturity model as here are the advanced stages of using our products. That's not showing an organization how to fundamentally operate in a different way. A real maturity model, again, is what the big consulting firms are using. They're show, showcasing, here's how the top retailer should be thinking about being competitive in today's macroeconomic environment, right? Here's how you're operating in a, set, a status quo. And here are the challenges of that, the pains of that, the quantified pains of that and staying the same of here's what that will lead you to. Here's where you can look in phase one and you should be thinking about the, the various things, how to operate, how to have change in your workforce, how to have a better relationship with your customers and the technology that you're going to need to enable that. And then once you do that, you can expect these outcomes. And then that will put you in a position to move to level two and so on, level three and yeah. level four. And that's a real effective maturity model. So I'd be looking for companies that actually have that and have um, an authentic blueprint on how to transform an organization. Again, that is going to put you in an elite category where you know you have real case studies of big brands spending over seven figure sums a year to fix real big problems. And there's a blueprint that you can position to that puts you in this category of talking about transformation, not selling transactions. So I took you down a tangent, which I'm glad we went down, but bringing it back now to yeah. picking diamond accounts, like yeah. you're in a role yeah. and in yeah. order to hit the seven figure mark, you need to pick out yeah. the right accounts. So can we get back to the criteria sure. that you defined? Yeah. So this stemmed a uh, quick backstory on, on what was happening for me of how I came up with this, this framework. Um, in 2018, uh, there was my first full year at live person and it was a grounding year. Um, a lot of good work was done, but a lot of overwork, uh, mm. overwork was done as well. It was really grinding at all hours. Coming out of 2018 into 2019, and 2019 was the first year that I entered the Seven Figure Earners Club. Um, so coming out of that 200K year in 2018 into 2019, um, my boss, Sean Burke, at the time, um, sat down with me and you know he just gave me really insightful information, which is, hey, Brandon, when you're in front of accounts that mean something to you, there's a different mm. quality in the air. There's a spark. There's a magic that you bring. Nice. Um, and it's noticeable, though, when you're in front of executives at an account that you don't know much about or you don't really care much about. Mm. And what you'd be better served doing is instead of trying to say yes, because I know you believe you can win everything, start being focused on uh, no. And the way to get there is slow down in order to speed up. I think you'd benefit from that. So I took that advice and I mm. reimagined my account list. I wanted to apply a filter where I could start to weed out those accounts that didn't have meaning to me so that I could design every single day around the pursuit of going after what I eventually called my diamond accounts. And the way I got to diamond accounts was I created a Venn diagram and I modeled after something that some people may or may not be aware of is this model called Ikigai. Ikigai is the Japanese concept of reason for being. 
Mm. And basically it's, it's a Venn diagram that has four different criteria that shows, Hey, when you're in the, the middle of this criteria, uh, you are, you know, working in a fulfilled way. So it's things like, what are you good at? Uh, what does the world need? What can you get paid for? And so forth. And I wanted to apply something similar as a filter to my account list. So I created a Venn diagram with five criteria. And it was things like, it's got to be interesting to me. Uh, it has the ability to move fast. It's an industry first for our organization, something that was meaningful to me. I, I really loved bringing on a big account in a new industry, um, something I had domain expertise in and, uh, again, was, was big. It was sizable, um, a big problem or, or something we could really um, go after. So things like moving fast, right? I immediately disqualified things like financial services or focused a lot less on healthcare because mm -hmm. I knew those industries were notoriously yeah. moving slow. So this became a criteria for me that now I could apply as a filter and everything that was in the middle was a diamond. And mm -hmm. so those were my precious accounts that I focused and had my SDRs focus their attention on with a little extra care. So by calculating the value of your time and having your Ikigai, North Star, and your Diamond accounts, you're actually able to say no more to the wrong accounts and opportunities to focus on the right ones. Because we know that, like your boss said, you could probably win them all, yeah. but that doesn't get you to Seven Figures Club. It's winning the right ones. We're yeah. passionate and excited. So, hey, I know we have 14 minutes left, and I still have a handful of questions. So yeah. um, we could do a little more of a uh, rapid fire. But how do you create the Diamond Standard? of selling. What is that? Continuing on the diamond metaphor. Yeah. What does that mean? What does it look like? Yeah. So it gets back to this theme that we've been talking about, which is elevating the experience. And, and again, my discovery uh, throughout my years of selling was that most people aren't suffering from a sales challenge. They're, they're suffering from, well, how do I buy this thing? Um, and what you really want to help them buy is this transformation. And, and so I wanted to apply uh, a very, very high standard uh, that again, my boss recognized, hey, when you're in front of an account that you really care about, it really shows. And those small things, those small details, the energy you bring pays off. Um, and so I wanted to create this experience that every email was a delight to them. Um, every meeting that we had, I was sharing something. I wanted it to be the best meeting that they experienced in the day. Oh, I've got to follow a very prescriptive sales process that's me focused on manipulating, not manipulating, but, but yeah, but, but me trying to convince them of something yeah. versus me designing this experience that brought out natural insights that they were wanted to curiously go after because they they felt the impact and and it was so ah this makes so much sense yes absolutely we should pursue this so i wanted to figure out how do i create that experience in everything that i do and it just came down to asking very simple things like would i respond to this email if i were mm -hmm. a level executive um, what, what did, what does this person care about and why, and what can I ask and what can I say that gets them to think differently? That's designing a better buying experience, because if I design a better buying experience, I know that they can do the selling for me. Um, I know also this forces me to bring in other people who have much broader and specific knowledge than I do. I thought of myself as a generalist with my skill set. back to this idea of I'm a CEO of my own company, my own startup. I'm treating myself as a brand. And the VC needs to support me with the resources I need. So I could bring in subject matter okay. experts. And I didn't have to worry about being yeah. the perfect negotiator, the perfect presenter, the perfect transformation specialist. Or the most technical. Yes. I just become a more or orchestrator. Those little things add up to delivering a high impact experience for the buyer. 
So that brings me to another key step to seven figures, which is rallying the troops, leveraging yep. other people that are technical, other resources backed by the VC to bring a solution to a customer. So yep. how did you mobilize and build consensus with the other stakeholders to drive these transformational deals? Make their job as easy as possible. You know, that was a, that was a key. So building in systems with um, your solutions consultants, uh, a, you know, schedule block, you know, make it very easy for them to understand certain things. Get leaders, executive le leaders excited about wanting to pursue this industry first, right? Everybody wants to enjoy their work. So how do you get people I excited? And so what I came to conclusion on is that writing started to become a really effective high leverage skill that helped with all of these things, but especially with you know, exciting my internal stakeholders. So crafting very clear memos around here is the opportunity that exists mm -hmm. if we were to pursue this account, right? And almost creating like a mini business plan that it would almost feel like, yeah, why wouldn't I want to be a part of this? Like, this is going to be fun to work on. Like, this would be really exciting to be a part of. Again, those small little things, really? not every seller is, is thinking about. And again, it was coming back to a core principle that I found uh, the internal cell becomes just as important as the external cell. Yes. And you need to treat that respect with respect because they're going to be the ones delivering this experience for you. You might as well bring in the top notch uh, expert uh, in a, a product category or a technical expert or security expert or uh, negotiation expert yes. when it comes to negotiating the contract, all of those things. Why take on that burden yourself? Yeah, that is such an important skill to get to where uh, you got to is to sell to your internal stakeholders and to yep. get the best resources First of all, saying like Brandon's the man, Chris is the man, I want to work with them and getting yeah. them excited about the opportunity. So that internal briefing, I've seen how important it is in my own experience. And I, I'm going to dig more into that. Love that idea. Yeah. Now, our lives and our success seems to be boxed in within the box of our beliefs. You know, we can only achieve it so much as our beliefs of what's possible yeah. allow us to achieve. And seven figures in one year in tech sales or anywhere, it usually doesn't live within the current belief system that someone might have. So how do you break through limiting beliefs yeah. and get to that next level to blow it wide open? Yeah. Um, so you, you really need to be protective of your thinking and think in a different way. Um, and you know, one thing that I started to, to let go of is goals. Um, and, mm. and a lot of people get shocked at that. That oh, is shocking. Uh, I need to have goals or I need to be very specific. I need to create smart goals. And here's the ironic thing in 2019, I did have a goal. I had a goal of earning 500 K and I could have worked backwards. I could have been very specific with my smart goals. This is the amount of activity, but eventually I scrapped that goal and adopted a theme instead. And I'm really glad I did because had I stayed in my goal mindset, I would have, I would have made the full year to fill that goal. And it would have been a glass ceiling that I couldn't have broken through everything would have been designed around that specific goal. But by adopting a theme instead, slow down in order to speed up, what that forced me to do was create systems, create frameworks that helped me make better decisions. That's what it fundamentally came down to. When I make better decisions in everything that's coming at us as enterprise and strategic sellers, which is a lot, right? When you incorporate modern life, um, you need to make high quality decisions. Systems and frameworks are the way to help you to make those decisions and take the emotion out of it. So when things like imposter syndrome creeps in, am I good enough to be in the room with a C-level executive of a fortune 10 company? Um, Am I a fraud? Am I going to be found out? Can I do this? Can I do that? You need to rethink those things that are gnawing at you and 
get them out of your head and repurpose them. Um, so one thing that always nagged at me was I'm a more introverted person. And certainly early in my career, I thought that was going to work against me. I thought that you had to be this extroverted person. It was all about building relationships. Deals were won over steak dinners and wine. And I had to eventually, you know, you know, deconstruct that and find that, wait, actually, there's value in being a more introverted um, seller. I listen more. Key, right? Um, I think more strategically. Um, key in developing research that will have great insights and impact. So I had to repurpose these thoughts and then double down on them as my superpower. So that, again, takes deep work. It takes the time and the intention to have those reflective moments into your day. My final question for you is to share a bit about your personal operating system. You know, yeah. I, I'm really excited to uh, dig into that because I think it's just played such a key role in your success, I can tell. Yeah. So as performance-based knowledge workers, we have this specialized knowledge in our head but only have a limited amount of time, um, you know, the same amount of time everybody does. So we need to ensure that our energy, right, is our differentiator because you can have all the time in the world, a free calendar, but if you don't have the energy because you're burned out or you're mentally unwell or sick, um, it's all for naught, right? Uh, a free calendar laying in bed does you no good. Yeah. You need to protect your energy and then you need to protect your attention right? Because it's easy to get distracted. The oh slack, slack notification goes off and then immediately you go oh. down a rabbit hole, right? The social media notifications. So we need to be deliberate about designing just like our phones have an operating system, our computers have an operating system, your Tesla has an operating system. You need to have an operating system for yourself so that you can harness your time, energy, and attention to maximum value, back to that core thing that we can measure easily, our effective selling hourly rates. What are the things that drive that up without burning you out so that you can start getting more meaningful with, does this satisfy me? Is this motivating me? Is this a priority? And you have this operating system to guide you in making decisions every day. Should I be looking at email or should I get to work on my most important task? Well, when am I identifying my most important task? Well, how do I know I ensure I have proper energy for tomorrow? Am I getting proper sleep? That's the whole basis of an effective personal operating system. So you, you can have maximum impact every single day, stay consistent and keep your success and satisfaction at peak levels. And Brandon, you have so, so much depth to you and your success obviously is not an accident because of that depth. So thank you for sharing that with us. Sure. You gave us so many nuggets. Guys, if you want to learn more about the personal operating system that will get you to seven figures without burnout and the other um, six steps in the seven step process, seven figures, make sure to check out the link in the description to that seven step system. Check out Brandon's website where you can subscribe to his newsletter. I'm subscribed and he puts out so many great emails and free content. And I mean, if you're okay with this, Brandon, I want to suggest that people connect with you on LinkedIn as well. Sure. Am I missing any other calls to action on your no, end? No, those, those are all the great places to find more. Um, I'm showing up every day in those places to deliver this content, unpack the, the system. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. This was awesome. Wishing everybody a happy holiday season and a very healthy new year. Happy holidays to everyone and happy selling and happy living. It's going to be a great 2023. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you.